Howdy, folks. I'm Ursula's unusual underwater urchin. I'm Amber. And here's some more spiny urchins. Poor unfortunate souls. I guess that fits here. All right, folks, our first letter today is titled, I'm a 24-year-old female, and my significant other, a 27-year-old male of one year, has destroyed a sentimental item of mine and sees nothing wrong with it because of the circumstances. And this one is seven years old, but it was sent in by Tony M. This is horrifying. I wish I had recorded my reaction reading through this the first time because... It's, it, I don't think I can replicate that kind of horror here. I'm sorry that your Monday morning is about to be spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to put a disclaimer on this one. This does have a lot of heavy themes involved with it. It's a very sad one. So if you don't feel like being sad at the moment, then this might not be the best one. But I do have another letter at the very end here where it is not as sad. So if you want to just skip to the end and be like, I'm going to watch the only happy one here, <laughs> then do that. Do yourself a favor. <laughs> Didn't mean for this to get so long, but it seems that it has. Thank you in advance for reading. I'm a 24-year-old female and my significant other is a 27-year-old male. We'll call him Eugene. And my sister, female, is deceased of two years. We'll call her Carrie. Background about my sister. Two years ago, my sister was killed in a car accident. She was riding with a friend to the mall. The friend's parent was driving. And a teenage boy plowed through a red light while texting on his phone and hit the car that my sister, Carrie, was in. Carrie was killed instantly, and her friend, June, was in a coma for three weeks before her parents finally took her off of life support. When Carrie passed away, I was devastated and angry and not in a good place. Carrie and I had been extremely close. Despite a seven-year age gap between us, we enjoyed a lot of the same shows, we went to concerts together, we volunteered together, and I took it upon myself to guide Carrie like a big sister would do. Our parents were extremely busy with work most days, and Carrie and I would often cook together and do crafts when we weren't too busy with schoolwork. Carrie wanted to be a NICU nurse when she grew up, and I helped her find a volunteer position at a local hospital to help her gain some experience being around patients. In short, Carrie was my sister and best friend, and when she passed, I was a mess. The last craft that Carrie and I made together was a set of candles. We bought the wax at a local craft store, and we both made each other a candle and decorated the jar it was in. That was the day before she was killed. At her funeral, Carrie was buried with the candle that I made her. The candle Carrie made sits on my desk next to my favorite picture of her together at the beach. Or it did until last week. Background about my boyfriend. I met my boyfriend about a year and a half ago, about six months after Carrie passed. I wasn't looking for a relationship, but I was still grieving my sister's death. But Eugene came along and it was love at first sight. He was extremely supportive. Let me cry on him when I needed to and didn't push me into getting over grieving or anything. He was extremely gentleman about everything and very patient. After six months of seeing each other pretty regularly, we made it official. Eugene came into my life at a very low point and has always been very respectful of sentiments that I keep from my sister, never asking me to take them down, always giving me space when I needed to cry. Eugene, along with most, if not all, of my friends and family knew about Carrie's candle. There was a point after she died where I would take the candle with me everywhere out of fear that someone might light it, or steal it, or who knows what. The point is that the candle was, and still is, a very important part of my life and something that my sister made for me and me alone. When Eugene and I moved in together about four months ago, I packed away most of the remainders of my sister's stuff and put out the candle and a picture on my desk. I felt that this was a huge step because when I lived just by myself, I had pictures everywhere and a few knickknacks laying around from my sister. I wanted to make Eugene and I's home our home with just a small part of my sister there. Eugene understood and was very supportive. The issue. Last week we had a massive winter storm that knocked out power. We didn't have power for three plus days. The power was knocked out at Eugene and I's house while I was at work, which did not lose power. Eugene texted me that he was going to light some candles and try to get a generator so 
we could have some power or at least be able to charge our phones and use some lights, etc. Now, we have probably about 30 plus candles in our house and I am a huge fan of sales and when Bath & Body Works has a candle sale, I like to stock up and get a range of scents. We have candles scattered throughout our house. In the room where my desk is, there are no candles aside from the one that Carrie made me. None at all. And there never has been. This room is also downstairs where Eugene doesn't spend a lot of time. His desk is upstairs. When I arrived from home last week, I noticed that a bunch of candles were burning in our living room, safely, always monitored, and not near anything that could ignite. One of these candles was the candle that Carrie had made me. I burst into tears, and when Eugene heard me crying, he came out from the bedroom where he was lighting more candles and asked what was wrong. I was a wreck and I couldn't get my words out. When he tried to calm me down, I shoved past him and locked myself in the room where my desk was and just cried. I don't know how he could be so stupid. He knew and I thought he understood how sentimental the candle was and how much I cherished having a candle that my now deceased sister had spent time making with me a day before she was killed. I haven't been able to speak to Eugene since it happened Tuesday of last week and he tried to explain why he did it because he needed candles to be able to see, but I just can't wrap my head around it. He hadn't gotten into the large candle stash that I have upstairs right by the living room where Carrie's candle was, but went downstairs out of the way to grab the most sentimental cherished item that I have. The candle was burning most of the day while I was at work and is now melted down and pretty much gone. I do still have a jar that it was in, but I can't look at it without bursting into tears. Reddit, what do I do? Eugene says that it was an accident, but I just don't believe that. He said that he was getting around to lighting the candle surplus that we have upstairs, but just hadn't gotten there yet. After being home for six hours alone without power. I'm heartbroken, and I feel like this is a major slap in the face. I feel disrespected. I feel like he has disrespected my sister. I just don't know what to do. I don't feel like I can forgive him for this. Can I or should I try to work past this? All right, folks, and we'll read a couple of the comments. I think there's one comment in particular that I think was actually really good and is referenced in the update that we have coming. And this is from Deleted. Is it possible that he thought only the jar and not the candle itself was sentimental? Still inconsiderate, but maybe less so? And OP replies, No, he knew that the candle was sentimental. I have expressed on multiple occasions to him and others that the candle and jar were both from my sister, that she made both of them. And Cast and Steel says, Has he apologized sincerely or just blown it off? The magnitude of his remorse should be your guide in how to take this. If he was just absent-minded dolt, then yeah, a mistake. But a more deliberate action would have him showing little or no remorse. And OP replies, he actually has not apologized, but instead tried to defend his actions by saying that he needed the candle for light, and then moved on to saying that it was an accident. But thinking back, I don't think he's apologized at all for this. And 70MS says... This may be the wrong idea and may not help, but as a sentimental crafter, I have a thought. First, I am so sorry about the candle. From what you've said about your boyfriend, I think that he just wasn't thinking. It might not even have occurred to him to remember that the candles are consumable and the wax would melt completely away. Okay, on to the next step. Maybe a stupid idea. So it's clear that you're still grieving over the loss of your sister. You still have the jar. On her birthday or anniversary of her death, or if that feels right, make a new candle in the jar. Pick her favorite color or something. When you make the candle, pour in all of your love for her along with the wax. Focus on that love when you're pouring. Think of the new candle as containing all of that love. Think of this as now something that you made together. She made the vessel and you made the love. Just a thought. Maybe cheesy and stupid, but maybe not. And OP replies, I actually teared up at work reading this. I never thought to make a new candle. I really appreciate the idea and definitely will think about it. This really got to me. I'm not over losing her because she was the one constant happy thing in my life and it's been hard. I will definitely consider a new candle to show my love for her. All right, folks, and to the update. A few people have PM'd me in recent days asking about an update, so here's it goes. 
My original post was the day before Thanksgiving. Eugene and I had planned to spend Thanksgiving with my parents, but that did not end up happening. On my way home from work, I stopped at a local craft store to pick up supplies to make a new memorial candle for Carrie. Thank you to MS7D for the amazing heartfelt suggestion. My parents and I spent the day remembering Carrie and making a new candle using some of the wax from the original candle. I also ended up purchasing a locket and having some of the remaining wax from the candle put inside and the locket welded shut by a friend. On the evening of my post, I got home and Eugene said that he wanted to talk. I agreed that we needed to clear the air before Thanksgiving, so we sat in the living room and started to talk. I was not ready for what he told me. A few commenters from my original post seemed to hit the nail on the head in a way. Eugene told me that when we first met, he was extremely turned on by the fact that I was essentially a damsel in distress. I just lost my sister recently, I was in a massive depression, and I wasn't myself. And that turned him on both sexually and in a protective way. Over the past few months, I started becoming more myself. I got promoted at my job, I've joined on a cooking class, and I've gotten out more, and I've definitely moved away from being a damsel in distress in the eyes of Eugene. He went on to explain that he burned the candle in hopes that I, it would throw me back into that phase because that's the only time he felt attracted to me. That's right, he's not attracted to me unless I'm upset, crying, and a damsel in distress. When I prodded for more information, he told me that everyone prior to me that he had dated had either just experienced a loss or was in need of rescuing. Eugene told me that he was no longer attracted to me and that he dreaded having an intimate time with me because he could no longer be that hero that was rescuing me, which is what turned him on in the first place. He didn't like to go in public with me because I'd started to pull myself together more, not just like wearing a t-shirt and jeans like I did when I was depressed, and that that had attracted stares from other men that he saw as a threat, taking away the damsel in distress. Eugene had a whole laundry list of things that he hated doing now because I wasn't in a funk anymore. I told him that if that was the case, then we needed to break up. He agreed and said that he would go stay with a friend until he could make new living arrangements. My name is the only one on our house, and I told him that I would give him 60 days to vacate the house, which he agreed to and said was fair. Over the past few weeks, I spent a lot of time with my parents and with close friends. I don't really feel like I've been dumped or broken up with, I just feel like me. Carrie's candle sits on my desk where the original one was and I wear the locket every day. Thank you Reddit for listening, I appreciate it more than you know. Alright folks, that was horrifying and I feel so bad for ruining your Monday morning. <laughs> Yeah, uh, poor OP here. Like, that is just such a horrible, horrible thing. Like, the dude is a... Dude needs help. Oh, like, the, the, that man needs therapy, massive amounts of therapy. And the one that, if anyone could not tell, this reminded uh, Tony of the plants one, mm -hmm. where he killed the plants because she was not paying enough attention to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a similar vibe there. Uh, and, like, it's one thing to want to feel needed. It's another thing to force your partner into a depressive funk so that you can fulfill that. Oh, like, yeah. No, this is twisted. What he did here was absolutely unacceptable. He should have expressed these feelings to her long before he thought, oh, I'm going to uh, burn her candle. Yeah, like wanting to keep someone you love, well, you're supposed to love, because clearly he doesn't love her if he wants to keep her in a depressive funk, because that's not what's best for her. Yeah. You know, he is only concerned with fulfilling his own needs. And his own fantasies. And his own fantasies. Like, and again, if you want to role play the damsel in distress thing in the bedroom, like, that's all in good, well and good as long as both parties are consenting to it. But it should not take over, you should not, like, force someone into a perpetual role where they need to be saved. Yeah, and certainly this should have required couples therapy a long time ago this man is a is not a good person no he should have taken this as a moment to reflect when his previous relationships failed and gone and gotten some help because this isn't a healthy way to approach relationships he doesn't need to be this weird hero that comes in and swoops in and saves these people like that's not healthy and two 
if he was really serious and had worked on himself and then found himself falling into this pattern of behavior again, then he should have talked to OP instead of burning the candle. Yeah, well, that's the thing is like it shows just how much he's not concerned about making the relationship work having it be a two-way street it's all just about well i have to get her back to this way i have to control her yeah control her, this whole situation so i can keep being the knight in shining armor yeah and i don't know why he thought that this would even work because this was something so important to her and so valuable to her that it was going to be a relationship ender no matter what and maybe he thought that she would just be so distraught that she would you know, fall into his arms or something like that. I think that's what he was hoping for. And what was he going to do? Continue to, like, push her into a depression funk anytime she started getting out of it? That's what it sounded like. It was just indefinitely keep her, you know, in a situation where she's always upset and needs to come running to him. Yeah, and this is just not good. Like, this guy really is, needs to work on himself. And, I mean, it's been seven years since this was posted, so hopefully he's had plenty of time to think, grow, and actually become a reasonable human being. Yeah. I mean, this is just not a good way to live your life. No, it's not. And, like, if you know this about yourself, like, you should not be with a partner if you know you're going to push them into a situation where they're constantly hurting and upset. Like, yeah. you shouldn't want to inflict that on another person. Yeah, I mean, partnerships are about working together to make each other better. Not working together to make one of you trapped in a depression, depressive state for endless amounts of time, right? And that's just not really not good at all. And he needs to understand that what he did here was completely unacceptable. And there are other ways, like, again, therapy here is what needs to happen, you know, because there are other ways to feel needed. You don't need yeah, someone always yeah. crying on your shoulder. Like, you can do little tokens, you know, and if, if your love language is, like, you like hearing affirmations, mm -hmm. like, that's something you can communicate to your partner and be like, hey, I really like feeling appreciated yeah. and needed. Yeah. Would you mind when I do nice things, you know, giving me a little accolade? Like, yeah, I think that this could have been something that he could have worked on and figured out a way of ex having them express their love in a way that fulfilled those needs that he had and not been destructive to, mm -hmm. like Amber said, tokens of appreciation, you know, words of encouragement, not being so jealous and threatened from other men. Mm -hmm. Like, that's just so weird. So I feel bad for OP here. Mm -hmm. And this is a sad story. It had a happy ending. And I'm glad that it ended the way it did because it sounds like OP was able to work through their problems and, you know, come out on the other side as a better person. Anyhow, take care and good luck, OP. All right, folks. And I know this is already a long episode, but I didn't want to leave you folks in a depressive funk because I'm not Eugene. <laughs> so we'll have a little bit more of a wholesome one here at the end. Our next letter is titled, Am I a Jerk for Taking My Future Wife's Last Name? My fiance, Nicole, is a 25-year-old female and I'm a 24-year-old male. And we are engaged and getting married this October. She has a very interesting Nordic last name, and she was clear from the get-go that she wants to keep her last name. She has a very close special bond with her parents, and she is one of the last in her family to have her last name. There is only one man in her family with the last name, and he is proudly child-free. I have a rocky relationship with my parents. I don't want to say anything bad about them because I love them to death, but things have not always been good. I started dating Nicole, I saw her relationship with her parents, and she encouraged me to spend more time with mine. So it has improved within the past few years because I see them frequently and keep them updated with my life. I am the last male with my last name. My fiance is the last childbearing age person with her last name. We aren't planning on kids right now, but it's the fact that we are both the last to possibly pass the name along. I decided, because I felt that it was important that sh we share a last name, that I would take her last name. She and her family were surprised and honored, and told me that they would support my decision no matter what. My parents found out that I was changing my last name in an inopportune way prior to me sitting down to talk about it. It did not go over well, and my dad refused to speak to me for a week. My mom would send incoherent texts begging and pleading for me not to change my last name, saying things like, in our culture, men keep their last names. You can't just change your last name. 
and that it was disrespectful and I had forsaken my family and that I was destroying the family by changing my last name. She also said that her future grandchildren deserve the name of my German last name. This is just so wrong. Please, please, please don't do it. There are many vitriolic, sexist, and unhinged texts, but those are just a few examples of things that she said. My dad and her refuse to understand that I'm a grown adult and they are now essentially disowning me and uninviting me from any family events in the future, like my sister's graduation party or a family trip that's already planned and paid for. For context, I am a white American man, so the culture she's referring to is white American culture, I think. So am I the jerk for taking my fiance's last name? And edited ad, her name is 14 letters and my current one is 8, so hyphenating is not an option. All right, folks, what do you think? Jerk or not the jerk? Not the jerk. And what I really like about this letter is just how well OP and his partner communicated on the last name thing. You know, OP was really into the idea of having a shared last name. Yeah, yeah. And instead of foisting me like, you need to change your name to mine, he's like, you know what? I'll take yours. And she and her family are like, you know what? That's cool, but we'll support you either way. So I really like yeah. how supportive they all were of each other in this whole thing. Yeah. And the only people who were really unsupportive are OP's family, which mm -hmm. is a shame, right? They were really trying to push OP to make a decision that they didn't weren't interested in making. And also, when your last name really has no cultural significance to you and really has no deeper meaning, it's really one of those things where your last name kind of only means something to you and the people that are around you, right? Whereas in the case of OP's fiance, it seems like they have really deep roots. They have a culture around this. They celebrate the culture. I mean, I could understand it a little more if OP and their family celebrated their German culture and heritage and made it a big part of their lives. But even then, it's OP's decision at the end of the day as to whether or not they want to change their last name. Yeah, well, and OP's parents are even going farther. And then they're not only insinuating that he shouldn't change his last name, but that she should give their future grandchildren their last name. Yeah. So it's, it goes above above and beyond even that into the territory of let's also coerce your partner into either her changing her name or at least giving all of the children that last name yeah and completely dismissing her family and her heritage yeah and so it's like night and day between op's uh parents-in-law and op's parents you know they they're super unsupportive they're not willing to compromise at all and they're like we don't support you at all and op's uh parents-in-law or like, you can do whatever you want. We're happy and honored if you do this. Yeah, so I mean, OP, I know it's hard and unfortunate your parents are doing this, but honestly, if they're just gonna throw a tantrum over this, like, do, you know, should not cave to them because this is gonna, you know, dictate your relationship with them going forward. If they can throw a tantrum and get what they want, it's not going to end with you yeah. not changing your last name. It's going to apply to your kids' names, probably to how you raise your kids. Yeah. Where will it end? Yeah. So I think you've made the right decision, OP. So anyhow, take care and good luck. All right, folks, it is tea time. Grab your beverages of choice. I've got some tea for this lovely Monday morning. It's probably rainy out. It's been rainy all day today, Sunday, <laughs> and uh, it's predicted to rain tomorrow. So some nice hot tea is good for that. And Amber has a joke for us. What did the left eye say to the right eye? Well, you know, the thing is this. If you have eyeballs and they have mouths on them <laughs> and they are in your head, <laughs> then it's time to see an optometrist and probably a doctor because there are some other deeper issues going on here other than the fact that your eyeballs are now somehow sentient and talking to each other. <laughs> well... To answer the joke, it's between us, something smells. <laughs> I suppose so. I suppose so. But I mean, also, <laughs> the horrifying, terrifying... <laughs> I have a horrifying image of eyes just talking. They're, the iris being the mouth right now. It's weird, folks. It's weird. And I have Mega Mint. All right, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for watching. Happy Monday. I hope your Monday is going fabulous. Amber, we need some kind of moral guidance. And just to show how generous I am from yesterday, make it a tongue twister of your own so that I don't have all the tongue twisters anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
Amber was just laughing about that. She's like, no. What what are you even doing, Brian? We found Amber's limit for for uh for moral advice. Oh, she's looking up a tongue twister. I am. This is not moral advice, but it is a tongue twister. Shelia shares seven shakes with shiny shelled snails resting on several swaying squashed squares. You know, I think that fits. I don't know how, but I'm sure we can tie a meaning to it. Well, there's a cute little illustration to go along with it. Oh, there's a cute illustration to go along with it. Look at that. It's a snail with a shell that happens to be a drink. Yeah, a a shake. A shake? Oh, yeah, I guess it would be a shake. Thanks so much for watching, and we will see you all tomorrow. Bye. Now we have probably 30 plus candles in our house. I am a huge fan of sales and when bed body... I'm done. I'm done. Bed body? What? What? Where? How? Bath and body works? I know there's no such thing as bed and body works. <laughs> well, you're just confusing it with bed, bath, and beyond. Yeah.